Okay, I think we're pretty much ready to get started. So hopefully everyone can hear me and can see the slides. Hi, YouTube. <laughs> so thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is the Ada Lovelace Week Arts Panel. And part of the objective of this is first celebrating the contributions of women and non-binary folks in technology alongside opening again a conversation of what it's like being a woman or non-binary person in technology related communities and professions. Um, so today we're really lucky to have with us Ashlyn Sparrow who is a Game Plus Experience Designer and Assistant Director of the Weston Game Lab um, at the University of Chicago. Ashlyn has a storied career, having been the Learning Technology Director and the Lead Game Designer for UChicago's Game Changer Chicago Design Lab, which produced educational games and mobile apps for urban youth, focusing especially on sexual reproductive health and STEAM, um, as well as the Creative Director of Resilient Game Studio. And we have with us um, as well Snow Shu, artist and designer currently pursuing a Master's of Design uh, Studies degree at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Snow's work focuses especially on body-oriented technologies to redefine what pleasure, vulnerability, and wellness are. And it's been just exhibited at Ars Electronica, where she was also selected for the Ars Electronica Future Innovator Summit in 2018. Um, in Snow's case, there will be content warnings uh, during her presentation for those who might be uncomfortable with some of the subject matter. Um, and so on. So as per our panels for the last two days, our, our format will have both panelists first giving a 10 to 15 minute presentation on their work and experience. Um, and then we'll end the day with a discussion slash Q&A moderated by myself. And for context, my name is Jazz Brooks. I'm an artist and PhD researcher in the Human Computer Integration Lab. And in general, if you have any questions for any of us, um, especially Ashlyn Slow as to do the presentations, please put them in the YouTube chat or the Zoom chat and then we'll be getting to them once the, the discussion gets kicked off. Now, before we start with the presentations, we're approaching the end of Love Lice Week, and there'll be one more panel tomorrow focusing on academia with professors Ellen Yiluendo and um, Marshni Chetty, both professors, uh, Marshni being part of uh, the University of Chicago's Computer Science Department. And this would not be possible without the help of my co-organizers, Jasmine, Yuqi, Dasha, Zoe, and Pedro, as well as our volunteers, Alex, Shanyuan, Romain, and Svetlana, um, who are helping coordinate the YouTube and Zoom chats. Finally, a big thank you to our sponsors, the University of Chicago Computer, uh, Co Department of Computer Science, the Physical Sciences Division, and the Center for Data and Computing, who is who are, um, helping us make this happen and pay everyone for, appropriately. Now, without further ado, um, Ash, please take it away, and I'll stop my screen share. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashlyn Sparrow. I actually go ahead and just use my little real face um, as I share out my screen. Um, give me one second. I need that. Perfect. And do let me all know if you can see my screen. Yep, we're good. Perfect. So hello, everyone. My name is Ashlyn Sparrow. Um, thank you all so much for having me uh, here talk, to talk to you all about the things that I love to do, which is games. It's primarily games. Um, as Jazz said, I'm the assistant director of the Weston Game Lab here at the University of Chicago. Um, and I'm also a game designer at the Forecast Lab, which is this kind of interdisciplinary connected uh, uh, collaborative um, uh, lab where we are working on creating games at the intersection of games and performance. And so I'll talk to you all a little bit about that. Um, and so before I get started on all the projects that I work on, I always like to just kind of, you know, break things down into levels, like gamers really love levels. So we're going to talk about games and design for just a brief moment. Um, because the first question that most people always ask me, especially if they're not gamers, is like, why games? And I love games just by virtue of the stories that they tell, the interactions, but also they're a huge cultural um, icon, um, you know, in the world. And so I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the game industry, like not, we know that 97% of high school students actually play games. The average age of a gamer is now, I believe, 37, and that's from the um, Electronic Software Association. Um, and so games are just getting larger and larger as we, you know, move forward in 2020. Um, it's now actually a $43.3 billion industry, and I think actually this number is a little bit old, especially since we're in this time of coronavirus where everyone is staying home and playing together, um, but apart from one another. Um, and so it's one of the industries that has continued to grow 
um, and because you are not required to actually be next to one another. Um, Grand Theft Auto, a game that was released in 2013, grossed over a billion dollars in three days when it was released, right? Pokemon Go had about 500,000 downloads of the first day that it was released. And then of course, Fortnite being a cultural icon um, and also a place where not only people are playing in this battle arena, but also places where people are starting to hold like concerts. So a popular DJ, Marshmallow actually held a concert there and I believe it was uh, viewed by 2.8 million people, right? So games are actually in this really cool, interesting transmedia space. And this brings up a game, League of Legends, um, very popular. But what I love about it is that you have all these characters that you can interact with um, and play with in teams, but also the, the companies are moving to start creating these, uh, you know, bands, right? And so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with uh, KDA. Um, I am a K-pop stan, first of all. And then when anyone puts K-pop in my video games, I'm just, I lose my mind. Um, so this is an example of like the possibility spaces of games that we can not only just have interactions mechanically, but also think about how we can interact with each other socially, but also create larger, broader, uh, experiences with one another. Um, so really briefly, what is a game? Um, and this is kind of the framework that I use to think about games that they, and this is coming from Jasper Yules, that they're fixed rules. They have this kind of variable and quantifiable outcome and that the people like you, you add, there's a value to that outcome. All players have to exert effort within those systems. Um, players are attached to those, uh, those, the, their effort but that consequences of the game are negotiable, right? So some, a lot of the games that we play don't actually have real world consequences to them, um, right? If you play you know, a game of Call of Duty, nothing is going to happen to you. But I'm really interested at this, at this overlap of gameplay and real world mechanics um, and real world policies and rules. And that sometimes I think it's possible to actually think of life as a game, how we all follow fixed rules in our life, right? That depending on what it is what we do, like we have to go to school, you know, from K through 12, that is required by the government, right? Um, but you, depending on your outcome, you, you know, you could go and get a GED, you could decide to drop out, like those outcomes are your choice, right? And you, uh, put value on those choices. You have to exert effort into this. And so it really gets me to start thinking, well, is it possible for life to be viewed as a game or actually bring more gameplay elements into um, life? And so I think about large scale systems that we interact with every day, like capitalism, right? And that for everything that you purchase, someone else will make more money from it, which will allow them to be able to buy more resources or, do, or enact new policies and lobby for policies. I think of the disparities that we all face in the world, whether that is racial disparities, whether that's religious or gender um, disparities and how those are, um, implemented by policies and rules based off of what people have designed. And so this also leads to the questions that I have around structural violence, right? So thinking about the political and economic social policies that create these inequalities and how it actually affects the society that we live in. Uh, this is a slide on gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is totally a game, right? And it's not, a, and it's not actually a fair one. And so thinking about game design how might we actually you know, make changes of our attitudes and behaviors around serious topics and use games to do so? So that's the work that I kind of do, uh, that I actually do at the, at, you know, the Western Game Lab and also the Forecast Lab. So some examples of some projects that I've worked on that are, you know, they, 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 they are really broad. So I've worked on card games, um, this is a card game that I worked on when I uh, ran the Game Changer Chicago Design Lab, which was primarily focused on public health. And so our goal there was to try and teach young people about how tobacco companies actually market to, to them. Um, but we you know, are always trying to think about ways that we can embed the learning objectives into these games. We don't wanna come out and say like, oh, you know, smoking is bad because people don't enjoy being preached to. We all don't enjoy being preached to, but 
we want to be able to provide a space for people to come to their own conclusions on their own. Um, and so for this game, we actually, the way that we designed it is that we actually, uh, actually kind of, you know, allowed players to be the tobacco companies. We allowed players to go and market to customers on the board and try and think about how would they design, design their marketing campaign, which again creates this one-to-one -one mapping of how would, a, how would a tobacco company interact and think about how to get the most customers and how can you actually do that within the game itself. Um, I've also created games um, at the Game Changer Chicago Design Lab um, around sexual uh, violence prevention. And so I've created games and worked directly with young people to design a game called Bystander. And so this is a game where we're trying to prevent sexual violence and, and harassment within schools. And the way to do that is to make it more of a community issue. And so here we don't want our players, right, to be the people who are the ones who are causing harm. We want them to be the heroes. We want them to help people. And so we put them in the role of a bystander where their goal is to really listen to their friend, really help them find the information that they need and help point them to resources that they might need um, to help deal with, their, with any issues that they might face and also learn about Title IX. Um, and so these are the ways that we're constantly trying to take these game mechanics and flip them on their heads and really get people to think about attitudes and behavior shifts in a way that's meaningful. Um, this is another game. Uh, we are, the, the games that we created here, we love, uh, you know, these kind of simulation games. And so we were inspired by SimCity to actually instead of you know, thinking about all of the buildings that you create and the capital that you, uh, you, you can build, why not use that same system to actually go out and think about public health and public safety and think about what is it that's necessary for a community um, to actually build themselves up. So I bring all of that up to actually talk about um, the games that I currently work on which are really alternate, which are alternate reality games, which are my favorite genre. And an alternate reality game is, is very different. It's a game that uh, uses the real world medium um, to kind of, to tell a story. You are a player that is actually interacting with the story, but the story is not limited by, you know, your standard screen. There's video, there's audio, there's emails that, um, that you can actually, you know, get. Um, you can actually talk to the characters. And they use this, what's called a this is not a game aesthetic, which I believe is, is fantastic because then it allows you to kind of really use the real world as your mechanism to kind of deliver educational content. So one of the games, uh, so when creating these games, they're so large. Um, and that's because we're really working together to, cra to craft a, an amazing narrative for our players. So I work with Patrick Jagoda, Heidi Coleman, Kristen Schultz, faculty at UChicago. I've worked with Pedro Lopez on this project. Um, and so we're really constantly thinking, how can we actually build out these experiences using puzzle designers, people in theater, sound designers, web designers, visual artists, all of these people can work together to create games for social change. It's super interdisciplinary. And so with these games that we create and because they're designed for UChicago students, we always reach out to UChicago faculty to really say, hey, you know, you're working on something that's amazing. Is there a way that we can use your research and bring that into um, our, our lab and our space? How might we actually share and showcase the work that you're doing and connect students directly to you? And then we also uh, always incorporate interns. And so our interns are an amazing group of students. This is our group of students who worked on uh, Terrarium who were creating quests and working directly with our players to kind of think through some larger challenges um, that our players could uh, go through. So I'll just kind of quickly talk through Terrarium and what it was. Um, and so this was a game that took place in 2019. It was an orientation game. Uh, and so, our objective was to get students to, you know, come to UChicago campus and start connecting with one another without actually having to physically be here just yet. 
and also to teach them about climate change. Um, climate change has been such a you know, known thing that we've been talking about really for the past 20, 30 some years. And we've known that this was a problem all along. So how might we actually use the, 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 the power of the university to really get students to start researching and thinking about ways that they can actually make change um, in the world. We also had a really cool time travel narrative. Uh, we were communicating with the year 2049. Uh, if you're curious about how that technology works, please talk to Pedro Lopez. He is one of the forecasters in this lab who helped us so much with this project. Um, and so essentially what, what was happening in this game is that as we connected, to the future, we were seeing what was wrong with the future and we're trying to actually help the person that we were connected or we're talking to escape the room and escape the room that they're trapped in and figure out how we can actually better society. We were able to uh, communicate with the future four different times and we actually interacted with four different futures. The first future of course was a climate change um, narrative uh, where you know the world resource depletion is is heavy, and so how might we actually think about making change today so that we never actually hit that future? The second world that we worked on uh, was a, focused on nuclear apocalypse, um, and so thinking about what happens when the when our countries start to go to war with one another and decimates the planet, and how might we actually you know again prevent that from happening? And each of these uh, characters that we talked to and interacted with. Um, would actually ex share their story using, we were, we were doing all of this in Twitch and we would actually interact directly with the characters and our players in real time to co-create this narrative together. The third world we created uh, was focused on mass um, in incarceration in the, in the police state. So every world that we're dealing with focuses on takes the word climate in very different directions and also tries to think about the larger social problems that we're facing, um, which we're dealing with poli uh, police brutality still to this day. And the last world that we uh, worked on was overpopulation, which is another issue that we you know, are currently dealing with. And so instead of having one person in a room, we actually had about 11 people in a room. And what we were trying to do is help them all get out this room and reset the future so that we would never actually go down that timeline. So that's a little bit of the projects that I've worked on. Um, I, I love them so much. Please ask me anything after uh, you know, this, this talk. Um, and the last thing that I'll plug is we're currently working on a game right now called Echo, also with the Forecast Lab, where this, this time around, we're really focused on getting people to understand the, how COVID um, spreads and really trying to prevent the spread of COVID on campus. Um, but also, you know, we've managed to find another, you know, universe and talk to another parallel universe. Uh, something's up with that and we need help to open up that portal. Uh, and that will happen on October 30th at 9 p.m. if you are interested in helping us solve this mystery. Um, so that is a little bit about me, a little bit about what I do. Happy to answer any questions later on in this panel. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Ash. So we'll be switching over now to Snow, who's going to be presenting for 10 to 15 minutes. Any questions that are in the, in the Zoom chat or the YouTube chat, we'll be holding off on them until Snow's done with her presentation as well. So without further ado, Snow. Hello, everybody. Just let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? OK, good. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today. Before I start, I would like to shout out to the amazing organizing team at the Human Computer Integration Lab for making everything possible during the lab place week. And my name is Snow Shu, and I'm currently a Master of Design Studies student at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And prior to that, I have the background in uh, making media art with technology as well as designing products with the disability community. Uh, for today's panel, I will focus on sharing with you how I use tech to create experiences for social intervention, for therapeutic sensations, and for human pleasure. So set yourself comfortably, grab a drink if you need. So when I was growing up, uh, I always found it very difficult to understand my own emotions, as well as the emotions and feelings of people around me. I remember being a super introverted, shy, and decisive kid and teenager. 
And because of how I was, I was constantly feeling pressured about having to be sociable, to be competent and perfect. So then in order to, in order to look quote unquote functional to people, I would try to cover my insecurities. I'm actually just so scared and socially awkward around people by hiding my, uh, any expressions of emotions. I learned to put on this expressionless dressing bitch face and speak in a very plain tone. So I don't, I don't expose my true emotions when I'm feeling nervous or insecure because I'm worried that uh, you know, I look weak to people. But as I grew older and tried to navigate more, uh, wait, hold on, wrong slides. Okay, seems like there's some lagging with my computer. I will go with it. Uh, but, as I, but as I grew older and tried to navigate more human relationships, I slowly found that my self-consciousness and insecurity was hiding my emotional vulnerability. It started to inhibit my growth as a person. And it is also causing me more and more distress uh, when I'm trying to communicate and form empathetic relationship with other people. So I realized it's perhaps time to unlearn this coping mechanism that I've developed to protect myself. I want to be able to feel something and I want to be able to acknowledge what I'm feeling. And I want to be able to share these feelings with people. Furthermore, I feel the need to undo the stigmas that we have around being vulnerable and weak as humans. So started then, I started to explore ways to embrace my vulnerability through my art projects. And I'm gonna start it, start it off by introducing a project that deals with my experience of being catcalled on the street in Chicago. Um, this was the very first project I made when I started so, to quick learn so. coding as a student. Yes. Your audio is a bit crackly, I think, right now. Interesting. Can you hear me better now? Mm, not yet. Can you hear me better now? <laughs> that's that's a bit better, I think. Could you could you speak again? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, should I go back a couple of slides or is an, anything wasn't clear? Um, I think people could understand it. It was just pretty choppy, that's all. Okay, okay, gotcha. Okay, so I'm gonna start off by introducing a project that deals with my experience as being catcalled on the street. And it was the very first project that I made when I, was, uh, when I just started to learn coding as a student. And it's called the Perfect Human Harasser. So Perfect Human Harasser is this machine that cat calls passerby humans. It runs this pretty basic facial recognition alg algorithm and it shouts out lines of harassment to those who it considers to be perfect humans, aka those people whose face it can recognize. So sometimes if you're wearing a hat, if you're wearing glasses, if you have a lot of beard, or if you have a darker skin tone, you may not be recognized and approved as a human by this algorithm. So in a sense, uh, from the perspective of this machine, people who are not recognized by this algorithm you know, are less perfect, less desirable as a human than those who are recognized. So the way this algorithm works um, really reminded me of my personal experiences and the experiences of many other gender minority people, which is that many times we're subjected to undesired attention and interactions on the street and out in the public. So when thinking in the case of this bias and discriminating facial recognition algorithm, the work uh, intends to ask, how are the aesthetics and values of human researchers behind this data set being consciously or unconsciously applied to the algorithm? And what if machine become this crude voucher that harass other humans in the public space? So I'm just gonna play this, uh, a quick snippet from the, uh, a documentation video of like when the original uh, version was in installed in a public space. Can you hear the audio? Okay, hold on. <laughs> yeah, it um, seems stuck on the current slide. Let me let me try again. Sorry about this tech problems. Yes. 
Uh, so just uh, so it was clear uh, in the second part at the snippet, the harassers basically say, look at those body, where are you going? Um, so it was interesting to see people's, uh, how people react when uh, they're being harassed by the harasser. Some people are super just surprised and startled and some are somewhat disappointed when they're not being catcalled up on and would pull super hard you know, just to trigger the harassment. And the initial version of this was like installed outside of an elevator in a public space. And it was constantly triggered. And then one day I found thought that, you know, someone found it too annoying because it's constantly catcalling people. So they just unplug, they just unplug it without informing me. Uh, cool. And another project that I would like to share play with this nuanced intersection of humans' vulnerability, intimacy, pleasure, and violence. And it's called Center for Beyond Wellness. So when I was conceptualizing this project, I wanted to deliver an interactive experience that serves as an alternative therapy for people to focus on their emotional and physical states. I think it is very important for all of us to be able to acknowledge and pay attention to what we're feeling at the moment, such as any forms of pleasure, anxiety, insecurity, sadness, anger, etc. And further, I want the experience to help people find comfort in finding and facing these mixed feelings and sensibilities, and to be able to come to terms with their emotional and social identities. So I designed this therapeutic device called the self-discipline pacifier. It's a device that offers cathartic touch through self-administered neck constriction. And the device basically inflates and deflates rhythmically around the neck for pacification. And it was inspired by uh, pressure therapy, which is you know, commonly commodified as the weight blanket you see on the market now. At the same time, the massaging movement is also constricting the neck highlighting this sadistic masochistic intimacy between the user and the therapeutic machine. The self-discipline pass fire therapy is housed in this interaction, uh, interactive installation called the Center for Beyond Wellness, which is a speculative therapy center that deal with humans existential crises. In the installation, audiences are invited to sit down for a self-therapy service. And there is an instructional video at, at the installation to guide the audience through the process of massaging and pressing their own necks and then uh, to warm up and then put on the actual self-discipline pacifier. So I'm gonna show an excerpt of the instructional video uh, that was at the, vid uh, at, at the installation to get audience through the self-discipline pacifier therapy. Slowly lift the self-discipline pacifier with both hands. Then, gently place the self-discipline pacifier around your neck. Make sure the side covered in soft fleece is the one in direct contact with your neck. Be cautious not to sit or recline on the tubings. Now, buckle up the self-discipline pacifier by snapping the magnet buttons on the left and right sleeves together. Feel free to adjust the size of the self-discipline pacifier by changing the pairing of magnet buttons. Please note that some gap between the neck and the self-discipline pacifier is recommended for optimal experience. You are now ready to begin the self-discipline pacifier session. Press the switch button on the self-discipline pacifier control box to begin the therapy. During the therapy, pay attention to your thoughts, your feelings, and your body rhythms. Use the up and down buttons to customize the pressure as you like. Be 
to use fire for as long as you desire. So as an alternative therapy framework, the self-discipline pacifier experience combines pleasure from the massage and the uncertainty of neck constriction for people to feel and affirm this ecstatic yet mortal vulnerability of being humans. The implementation of pressure for pacification here is inspired by the shuts that farmers use to constrain and pacify animals when they want to milk them, for example. And the basic science behind this pressure therapy is basically that when there's even a moderate pressure applied on the human skin, uh, skins of mammals, a relaxing hormone is basically released in the body to cause, to cause sensations of pacification and calmness. And the same idea is later uh, integrated in Temple Grandin's squeeze machine design and also adopted to this kind of squeeze roller hugging device designed for children on the autistic spectrum. So I find these designs super mesmerizing because um, of, of because of the contrast between how they totally look like torture machines, while you know psychologically and physically they're supposed to make you feel so relaxed, pacified, and calmed. And by placing the human audience in this experience where there is a discrepancy between the visual message and the psychophysical one. The experience becomes complex in the sense that it's not simply one feeling at a time, but perhaps a mixture of comfort and uncertainty in different ratios. And I found this a truthful representation of our human experience, as there's always a bit of pain with any trickle of joy. And as part of the process for audiences to zoom in on their feelings, they have to become their own therapists and patients. And this is a quote from Audrey Lord, which I found super powerful and resonate a lot with my ideas behind this project. It reads, I feel, therefore I am free, for there are no new ideas, there are only new ways to making them felt. While we suffer the old longings, battle the old warnings and fears of being silent and impotent and alone, while we taste new possibilities and strengths. And for those of you who are worrying about the safety of the device, there are some safety precautions integrated to make sure um, it's easily removable from the neck if needed. And there is a button for adjusting the pressure level based on, based on personal comfort zone. And there are um, air pressure sensors embedded in the hardware system to make sure that it does not exceed a preset safety threshold. So let's make sure that nobody gets hurt during the experience. And I'd like, I'd like to wrap up uh, by talking about an event I co-organized here earlier this year at the University of Chicago. Uh, it is called the Object Oriented Orgasm Hackathon. And as the name pretty literally entailed, it is an event for folks from different disciplines of art, design, creative tech, and, engin and engineering to come together and experiment with creating, creating objects for bodily pleasure. So this is just a family photo from our 2020 cohort this year. So when we were organizing the event, uh, from our perspective as artists and researchers working with HCI or art technology, we're aware that there's this painfully uh, lake of conversation about sex in the field, which is made worse by the taboos and stigmas around the, around the topic. And we find it problematic that the sex tech industry used to be very dominated by straight men, uh, or more precisely, very dominated by cis, straight, able-bodied men. So not only there are gender inclusion, there's also a lack of representation of people with disabilities in sex tech industry and the user pool. So that's why when we first kind of plan the event, we think it's important to rethink for whom and for what body these experiences are designed for. How do we make things more inclusive from a gender, sexuality, and anti-ableist standpoint? And how do we make people feel safe, acknowledged, satisfied on the physical, psychological, and social level? And how do we destigmatize the conversation of sex and make it fun for everyone? 
So unfortunately, I have to insert a trigger warning here in the next uh, couple slides. There are going to be some more images or text about sex toys and adult content. So if you do not wish to see those contents, or if you have a young child around you that you do not wish to expose these content to, uh, please evacuate them at ASAP. I'm just going to give everyone a couple seconds if you need to do that. And um, let's proceed. So this is a sketch that one of the team at the hackathon done to categorize the market available sex toys based on their visual design. On the left, there's something that look, uh, you know, very close to a human genital. And on the right, something that is more of an abstracted geometry form. So I think the intention behind this uh, was really to think what are the ways to design beyond this stereotypical super phallic dildos or vibrators that we commonly see on the market. And this group uh, ended up exploring the erogenous zone beyond the genitals and the human body. And as you see on the screen here is one of the final conceptualization uh, sketch they did, which is this uh, snake-like vibrator that entangled int intimately on the neck and the ear area for a vibrational pleasure and neck constriction. And this is uh, another team who uses machine learning algorithm to train uh, basically train this program to auto-generate porn novels. I'm just gonna read uh, two of them real quick for your convenience. So the first one goes, and then they suck me in like a wet dog. I could feel the inside of my pussy. I was sure it was a mixture of pleasure and harm. And then they spank me with the butt that they given to me in the shower, he said. I can't, and I can't swallow my cock, so I'll just, so just drink it and eat it all. But I will come, and I will come if it's not too hard for me. And I want it to come in my mouth. So <clears throat> you get the idea. And this is another project uh, on the left here. It's a project about designing custom adjustable vibrator sites for this, different personal preferences. Uh, on the right here is a project that, uh, that explores stimulating the vocal cord to create uh, uh, experiences of communal healing through the activation of vagus nerve. Uh, also, there's two more projects heard on the right here. Uh, the project deal with uh, exploring whether it's possible to develop a two-way intimacy between the human and the machine, which is a sex toy. And on the right here, this team develops a multi-personal touch game to facilitate, facilitate intimate touching between two people or a group of uh, people. And uh, on the left here, uh, one of the team also worked on innovating uh, and developing mutually pleasurable augmentation for dental den, uh, which is the female condom. And on the right here, uh, one of the participants, she developed a skin-based touch interface to control the sex toys. And last but not least, uh, one of the team explored how vibrational stimulation worked in non-Newtonian fluid. So they're basically testing the sensation vibrator in a bucket of cornstarch mixed with water. And that's all for the 2020 project from this year's hackathon. And I'm just gonna insert a plug real quick as well. We're also uh, planning for the 2021 event, which will be virtual. So if you're interested in participating or joining our organization team, you can check out our website uh, or our social handle listed on the page here. And that's all for my conversation. Thank you for bearing with me and the Zoom tech issues. Okay, thank you very much, Snow. Let me just quickly get this working in gallery view, if I can figure out there. That, that should be it. Great. So we're now going to be moving on to our discussion portion of the event. And for this, I'm really hoping that we can make it a discussion. I know it's kind of like an asymmetrical format right now, but I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try and facilitate this as much as possible, especially for reading the questions that we've received already. And this also means that panelists should feel free to ask questions as well if they have questions to each other or questions to the audience, for example. Um, so at this point, feel free to unmute yourselves. And I'm just going to quick, quickly start off with two questions that we received um, that are actually pretty fast, I think, in responses. So the first one is from John, um, who asks, how do I find or enroll people for these kinds of alternate reality games? And I think this is directed at Ash in particular. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have a site called forecastlab.com, F-O-U-R, uh, cast, C-A-S-T.com. Um, so that's where you can find information about all of our past games and all of our current games. 
Um, and our current game is currently is at echo.forecastlab.com. And so that's where you can sign up and play the game. Um, so yeah, we make this all available online, free to play, nothing, you know, you don't really need anything to, you know, be a part. Great. And then a question for Snow in particular from ElectroStarter. Um, Snow, this is this work is all amazing. Beyond checking out your projects, I just wanted to ask the, about the hackathon. Did anybody build devices that were that would be commercial or continued working afterwards? Um, and what are the next steps you envision for UHAC? Um, I think so far, from what I know, a lot of projects were more experimental, and specifically, people back then wasn't like really intense was not intentional of, about making then a commercial product. So more keeping it in the experimental zone. And one of the project, like the project was the simulation of the vocal cord and the vagus nerve. Uh, that project actually got developed more fleshed out into a full um, kind of web game uh, experience later. So there is possibility for people to, to, people to continue working on it in the future. And in terms of the future vision for UHAG, um, that is a tough question. I think we're still trying to figure it out as we go, but I think we definitely want to be, uh, we want to like reach out to more communities from more like the uh, racial background and also potentially people who are disabilities and are interested in participating in, in, the, in this, you know, creation process. And, um, you know, if you have any suggestions, recommendations, you know, anything that you want, that you think will be a good fit, feel free to let us know. Great. So I'm going to turn to a quick question that I had listed for as like a first question to open things up. Um, so have you had, have both of you had encounters where other people, for example, men or people in power don't understand your work and how do you navigate this slash what recommendations do you have for people that might be experiencing that early on? Oh man. Uh, yes, I've definitely experienced this. I, I've actually experienced it more, um, when I intersect with folks who are in like, I would say the, the traditional game industry. Um, so I went to GDC, the Game Developers Conference, I don't know, like four or five years ago now. And so when I was telling them, oh, you know, I work on educational games and, you know, I was talking about learning objectives and, you know, we're thinking about how we can, you know, change people's uh, behaviors and attitudes around sexual reproductive health. And then like the one guy was just like, so like you make condom games. And I was just like, I didn't even say that at all. I'm not even mad about that, but it was like this just way of like, I'm, I'm giving information and I'm trying to spark a conversation of what's possible for them to just kind of shrink it down to be like, okay, so it's just this. And then I follow up and ask like, so how many condom games can you just like make? And I'm like, what are we doing right now? Um, but what's been great uh, just in my general career is that I have not actually had too many encounters with those folks, just because I find that the space that I'm in at the university and also with my independent game developer friends and the artists that I know, that we're, we're in the space where we're really trying to be collaborative and experiment, um, such that you, know, you, you kind of get your energy from your groups of people, your, your friends and your colleagues. And, and sometimes you just have to know within yourself that what you're working on is the thing that you need to be working on. And so you, you, you'll you just sometimes have to encourage yourself to keep going and definitely just like forget all these haters because there's just going to be so many of them throughout your career. Yes, uh, actually for you know all of my projects, I've you know, always, I've usually encountered some kind of man that is somewhat apprehensive because the subject of like, you know, emotional vulnerability, intimacy and all that are like somewhat of a, you know, allergic subject to many men. And uh, especially for the neck construction uh, project with the self-discipline self pacifier, when I was working on it, uh, I researched a lot into uh, stuff like BDSM, fetish, uh, and all that. And whenever I try to like have conversation with a professor about it, you know, which, you know, note is usually like some kind of white male professor in the media art department, like they will feel very hesitant and apprehensive about the conversation because on one hand, you know, they feel uncomfortable talking to me, a female student about this. Like, you know, they, they, their fear of being like, you know, I will report them to the school for saying inappropriate, inappropriate stuff. 
on the other hand, this is something that uh, is outside of the comfort zone of their uh, daily conversation, is not something that they're used to talking about. So I think like a lot of times us artists and creators, we, we think about like our work as like this kind of a platform like of like, you know, delivering the message and wanna talk, that we want to communicate, you know, you know, to like broadcast it to people. And it usually start with this kind of one directional broadcasting method. And sometimes, you know, when you reach someone that really emphasize with your, your project, uh, you know, it becomes a two-way dialogue when there is a lot of interaction, exchanging and, you know, sharing of ideas going on. And some other times, you know, it's just, it just remain a one-way broadcasting system because that, you know, that shared understanding or shared emotion just like never reach. And kind of like just like as what Ash say, like, you know, haters or people who don't understand it, it's always going to uh, exist. And I think at the end of the day, it's important to understand, uh, you know, for you as a creative individual, it's it's like we we, we can only do so much, you know, to, trying to reach out to people. And we're like not ob obliged to really like, quote unquote, educate, but like enlighten everybody about uh, everything. So I think that's something to important to keep in mind and really prioritize uh, binding with, with those people that can, uh, you know, reciprocate the support. Thank you. Um, so just as a heads up for people, I'm probably going to jump around questions to try and create like a, a structured conversation. So right now I'm going to jump to Yue Kuang's question, which is great. Hi, I think both of your projects are very cool and groundbreaking. I'm curious about how do you, you both measure the effect of your design? Can you talk more about that? And I'm going to expand it a bit more by saying, for Ash, for example, ARGs are incredibly hard to quantify and measure. And for Snow, your work is so intimate and sensorial and interaction off these days. So like what what is success or what do the, the effect measurement? What does that mean for both of you? If you want to go first, Snow. <laughs> um, sure. I think um, kind of extended from what I said. You know, usually when I make some make when I make something and it feel too personal, too intimate, too uncomfortable for some men, then I know it's it's it has an effect and it's doing something <laughs> in a very satirical, it's a very sarcastic way of saying it. Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, for myself, I usually just try to. Uh, for each of my projects, I try to like focus on a different type of interaction or different sensory. So like from my own perspective, as, I, as long as I'm learning something new or like, you know, something that I haven't done before and receiving some kind of, you know, audience interaction that I would not expect, I think that, you know, I, I will consider that as, as effective. I don't know if that answers your questions. <laughs> So I've gotten the joys of working like at a public health organization where like measurement is really, really important. And so, you know, for that, we're really looking at like a literature review, right? Your kind of standard uh, research where we're looking at measurements of like intentions and behavior change. And then, you know, asking survey, uh, giving survey uh, questions out and tracking those changes between our participants over time. Um, and so for those research heavy games, there's very clear measures as, as defined by the grant projects of we are trying to increase interest in STEM education. And so there are STEM measures that we can use to then check that. So that's a little bit more clear. Um, but like Jazz was saying, like ARGs are like these wild kind of amorphous uh, projects that it then becomes a question of like defining what success means to you early on. Some of our, a lot of our games have an educational component. So for instance, Terrarium focused on teaching students about climate change, but also, you know, we had different, we had, so that's like a knowledge based um, measurement, but we were also really concerned about like, how do we get people to feel connected to each other before they even get to campus, right? And so that's something that only comes out through qualitative data. And so the great thing about, you know, working on an interdisciplinary project is you just have, you know, more people come and work and like bring their thoughts and viewpoints and their disciplines to your work. And so we actually work with Kristen Schilt, who is a sociologist um, in, uh, and, and she uh, runs the Gender and Sexuality uh, Center. And so 
she she will do focus groups with our players afterwards and try and just get general questions like so how did this you know work for you what did you think about x y and z and we'll pull out all of those qualitative pieces um but sometimes it's just a question of like okay this is the first time we're doing this like is it possible for us to even get 60 teams signed up right and that just becomes a measurement and it's something that you know when you get 60 form notifications that teams have signed up it's like winning done like that's success everything else that might be falling apart right now it's fine because we got the thing that we needed and we can actually move forward with that so it's this really interesting kind of improv sort of thing that we're working with so a question from spencer um and i'm going to try and crack this open afterwards uh, so that both panelists can answer so for ashlyn um when creating args at what point do you consider the relationship between the story slash artistic vision and the technological implementation when designing these complex aspects like time traveling and terrarium. Um, they're curious about how the two are in conversation as you create the final product. And I'm just going to try and open this up for Snow as well, because this is a this is a big problem in New Media Art that we've we've talked about in the past, which is the question of how do you balance vision with tools that you're learning or what's of currently available or currently popular. Um, so if, Ash, if you want to go first. Absolutely. So that's a really interesting question. So um, with ARGs, you're kind of co you're co building a world with your players. You start off. It's very similar if you've played something like Dungeons and Dragons, a tabletop game, right? Where you have a person who has like high level objectives of a narrative arc that you're trying to hit, um, but a lot of the details are still kind of left up in the air because we know that players will come in with their own ideas as to how you know, these characters might relate to one another, what certain things might mean in a set. And so we leave that space open because we want to build this shared world together. Um, so in terms of technology, what we're also playing with is a strength-based model. Um, each and every per person that we work with has their own skill set. So the person that we work with who does a lot of the Twitch-based stuff and the live cinema stuff is Mark Downey, who is a lecturer in cinema media studies. And so we're constantly asking the team, OK, what's a cool thing that you kind of want to work on or this thing that you have been working on? Um, just, just talk to us about it, right? And so when Mark Downey says, you know, I've been really interested in looking at how to use Twitch as a means to like, you know, do performance, that works amazingly because our other co-collaborator, co Heidi Coleman, who's in theater, says like, oh, I always wanted to figure out how to also do interactive, um, you know, theater, right? And so like, we're, we're starting from a place of what is it that is possible for, for each of us? Um, not necessarily from a place of like, oh, what's super cool? What's the hot new thing? It's just like, because it's this core team and we're gonna be the ones who have to make it, we have to be really good at what it is that we do and we hold. And, you know, and, and, and that's the thing that we kind of always hold together. Like we're gonna, you know, use Twitch, we're gonna use this website because those are the things that we can do. And then we'll allow the narrative to kind of move in the direction that it needs to based off of the players and we're, and we're totally fine with that. So we give up a lot of that kind of creative control to be quite honest, to allow for that collaboration. And in terms of, uh, in the case of media art, I think it's really important like you know, how, where do you position yourself in these art world? Because on one end, there's like the art industry that is like, you know, very hustle heavy and has, has very, uh, deep connection to the, those, all those uh, institutions of powers and the sponsors, the sugar daddies with the monies and you know, all this bots work that they're you know, constantly you know, slapping in our faces. And on the other end, there are people who want to like, you know, real interest in like exploring stuff that have never you know, possibly, that they're personally interested in or haven't been done before or are considered too subcultural or like, you know, not mentioning at all to get the funding or like the attention they need. So I think the first step is really to, you know, identify what you want, you know, as an individual. And I think that's, that's like, there's no clear answer to that. And I don't even know, like, you know, how, I think, it, you know, I don't even know, like how, what's the best way to navigate it per se. But I think for me personally, like I want to prioritize, like, you know, making meaningful stuff. And that is, that is, uh, you know, making it, that is 
putting a valuable social uh, commentary out there instead of something that just, you know, uh, catered to the trend um, or, you know, makes the sugar daddies ha uh, happy. But uh, on that note, like since we're talking about like vision in terms of media art project, another thing that I think is uh, super interesting, like at least in the scope of like art creation is also have like, you know, another, have like another space that you can basically uh, alienate, like stand back a couple of steps and look at like review your art practices and your identity as an artist, like whatever that means from a more third person perspective and really reflect uh, what your practice mean to yourself. I think that's more helpful for like the long-term growth and long-term vision of, you know, you as a person who creates and makes stuff. So jumping on kind of the idea of like foundations uh, fostering directions in artwork, for example, and in video games. Um, I was wondering if I could have your thoughts on kind of the, tr the recent trend of foundations beginning to invest in the idea of empathy, right? Like the VR as an empathy building machine or games can give you empathy. Um, and there was a fantastic piece a couple of years back by W. Sebastian Camo called Rooms Full of Mirrors that kind of questioned whether we should be creating empathy and what that means that these, these things are creating that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I always, it, there's always a good question about empathy that comes when I talk about games. Um, and I, to be quite honest, uh, I'm just gonna, this is my, my own thoughts and feelings about these. There's no real research attached to this, but there's something about, there's something that I don't necessarily feel like you can just like with a game, people are just gonna naturally be empathetic by just playing that game, I think you really need to frame the experience before a person, so, and then once a person interacts with your, your game, then they, there's a possibility of them being a little bit more empathetic, but that framing is a thing that's really important. In the same way that like from at the research, right, violent video games do not make people more violent, right? It, it, there is an, an increase in aggression, but no one like physically in terms of behavior does anything and in my mind I'm just thinking from like a logical standpoint well if we want games to make people more empathetic we would then actually want the opposite to be true too of we would want violent video games to make more people violent like that is the kind of logic that is in my mind if violent video games do not make people more violent why would video games make more people empathetic right but that's not to say that there isn't an effect that games have on people because like, I wouldn't have been a game designer if I've never played a game, right? People are inspired to write movies and books based off of the games that they play. And people, you know, do learn more when they, like games provide like a multiplicative, uh, like increase in knowledge when you, when you turn it into an educational game. So there is something that's happening there that I think in terms like moving a little bit beyond the empathy game question, I am more so curious about how might we figure out a better form of measurement for games that makes sense with the medium of games. Um, a lot of folks who are doing the measurements are coming either from education or computer science or like English and, and they're all using their own specific disciplines to measure those games. But games are kind of weird and games are always interdisciplinary. So then I just wonder like, perhaps we might need something completely new and coming from a completely different place. Maybe it's something else. And I am waiting for that to happen so that we can then figure out what are the true effects of games on a population. But I think with the right framing, any game can make you more empathetic or less empathetic about a specific topic. And sort of added, adding on to what Ash just said about, you know, putting people in the right context for the game. I think in the context of like art, it is very important to think about, you know, what are like how to peop, how to ease people into this psychological process when they become more like acceptable and like, you know, more reflected and more introspective when they look at your work. And also like when they're done with experiencing the work, you know, how do you want them to continue this thought process? 
So as, as what Ash said, like a lot of work need to be done, you know, before people experience the work and like, you know, after the actual experience of the work. And a lot of times, you know, empathy also become this kind of like hot word that we realize to almost too much on. And, and, you know, because it's very hard to quantify, you know, it's very hard to judge whether it, it was actually effective or not. So I think in my uh, perspective, maybe there should be some actual, you know, actions, you know, that, that is like something quantifiable, measurable, and tr that can be tracked after uh, the experience that can entail, oh, these people understand this and, you know, they are ready to, you know, commit to this and that. Um, so I'm going to quickly ask a question. So we're going to continue probably for like 15, 20 minutes more. Uh, so there's like maybe room for four questions or so, depending on how, how we talk. And we can stick around if we want if also as well. But um, one of the questions is from John that I think is very interesting is how do you find, this is like especially targeted at Ash, but I'm going to try and uh, kind of like reword it for Snow as well. How do you find players, right, for alternate reality games? And I think you've been asked this before at the Hammer Museum. It's, it doesn't feel like a game, right? When you get an email like this, there's that kind of blurring of the reality in the game. And in Snow's case, um, how do you think about your work as saddling kind of like between fine arts interaction and really therapy, right? There's an aspect of it that's, that's supposed to be the person doing self-healing processes or communal healing processes in your more recent work. So Ash, if you wanna go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's a really good question. So um, again, I always want to stress the interdisciplinary nature of the work that we do and also constantly reaching out to folks to help us recruit players. So in order to find our players, we usually we, we connect up with uh, the administration, right? They're the ones who have access to every single student on campus, whether that is the college or whether that's the medical school, et cetera, et cetera. And so we go to them and say, hey, we're working on this thing, right? And we, you know, go through the rigmarole of explaining what the learning objectives are and what we're trying to do, build community. And, and you know, after we build those bridges and build those connections and build that trust, then that allows us to then craft a letter that they will then email out to people, um, which it, it does very much look like a real letter from an administrator. Um, but the key thing about designing one of these ARGs is that there is always something that's a little far-fetched that makes you go, huh, is that actually even possible, right? It gives you a kind of taste of, I feel like this is a game, but I'm not sure if this is not a game, right? And so it's this, this kind of, it's less about a suspension of disbelief and just actually creating a little spark that it is actually possible that this is real, right? And it's that, that tiny little bit of doubt that is all we need to just allow people, that, that also allows people to just be like, okay, let me just give this a try. Let me just see what's happening. Um, and and again, there's always it never we never take things too seriously where you couldn't you know distinguish that this is you know a game or not. But it really comes down to the players. We've had some students who really after you know playing a game with us for four weeks really after the end thought all of this was real and they were upset that they're like there's no time travel near like are you serious uh and then having to go through that you know process of like debriefing about oh well what made you think that this was real we're curious about that right but also constantly making sure this is a safe space for our players right so that if they do believe truly that we are like we're taking an ethical stance and always you know allowing people to come to their own conclusions and not forcing any, you know, specific ideologies onto them, right? It's very different from, you know, what folks out here like QAnon are doing. It's wild. So. Yeah, and I'll repeat like the the turn for snow, that, that version of the question. So there's situations where your work might not be seen directly as artwork in the sense that it's, it functions beyond art in some sense, uh, what people might traditionally view as art. So how do you think about the way your work can function not only as artwork, but as like tools for self-healing, right? So I think first of all, it opens up more flexibility in the sense that it's not necessarily confined to you know the gallery space. You know, if you know if there is a possibility to you know apply this and install this in many public spaces or daily spaces, or even extend um, 
to the domestic uh, personal space uh, of an individual, uh, ind you know, of ind individual people. And um, for me, like, I think now more and more so nowadays, I like, I, I, I worry less about how I define myself, whether I'm an artist or not. Like this, I think this is something that I am, I am interested in doing, like this intersection between art and therapy. And so that's what I'm doing. Like, usually it's just like a, like a label or like a quick um, keyword to, you know, to, you know, make people who are not so familiar uh, about this interdisciplin interdisciplinary work that I'm doing uh, to, you know, get a quick sense. And on the other hand, um, the reason why I, 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 use, I merge like the therapeutic framework in my art practices is also because I think that a lot of times like, you know, clinical therapy are not readily accessible to a lot of people. And also for people to, you know, go to a therapist, they either need to be diagnosed or self-diagnosed of having some kind of symptom that they need to seek help. But a lot of times that is not a, a very explicit or like obvious fact to people. Like some people might be experiencing some type of um, emotions or feelings that trouble them, but they can identify that this, this is a signal that they need for help. So the way that art, uh, you know, or any kind of a communication platform can function in, in this space is really to just an alternative way for people to, you know, in, in, in the case of my work, to be more introspective, to pay attention to what they're feeling. And then, you know, if they really need help, they will reach out to, you know, professional support from medical, uh, from medical professionals or clinical professionals. So I think like I'm not thinking about my work as a sub substitute of any kind of uh, clinical services, but more as this uh, kind of, this tools for people to reflect on themselves in a more, uh, in a more familiar, uh, in a more familiar spaces, like, you know, within their daily routines. Yeah. Great, thank you. So one question is kind of more geared towards the fact that both of you are phenomenal community organizers. Um, so now you've been doing things with, with UHAC. I know you've been doing things in our, at Harvard as well with Women in Design. And Ash, your job is about fostering community in the, in the West and Game Lab. Um, so I guess one of my questions is, what do you think is important when creating collaborative spaces that aren't just inclusive for people but also receptive to their ideas, because there's, there's always examples of people being at the table, but not being able to do anything. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of building, like this is gonna be sound strange, right? Like, like sometimes, it, like if everyone has this idea of like consensus, then like that means that that's it, right? There's no space for difference. There's no space of a different idea. And so like I'm, always interested in communities that enjoy a certain level of self-obsolescence and say, oh, you know what? We hadn't even considered, you know, your perspective, your idea. We should actually change, right? And we should change so, uh, so that we can include, you know, whoever. And, and to me, because you don't usually see that in the world, that is the thing that I ultimately want to cultivate at the Western Game Lab. Um, the fact that I am people's first probably black professor that they've had if they're at UChicago is already a space of me holding difference for them. And it's like, okay, this is this is great. This is fine. Let's let's do this. Right. The fact that many people have not interacted with a like female identified game designer, right? Like it's already like the space where I'm just trying to hold and say, like, it's possible, right? And because I know the journey with, you know, it's, it's a bit isolating because I, I haven't met too many other black female game designers. It's only a recent phenomenon that I've met someone who looked like me in the industry. And so like, I, this makes me extremely empathetic for other people, you know, who are also, you know, trying to find their community. Um, and so like, I'm always constantly like, okay, like how can we make sure that, you know, this game, uh, this game lab, is not so tech bro, dude bro centric. There's a reason why I advocated so hard for like pink because that is so antithetical to what 
typical games represent it's always like you know black or neon blue and i'm like that's fine i don't get me wrong my computer glows those colors too but how can we automatically just signal that we do things differently here and that if someone does something that we don't like we just say we don't do that here right and then there's no way there's we're not passing judgment on the individual, passing judgment on where they heard that from, but it's just like, we don't do that here. The Western Game Lab does something different. Like, we, and we are trying to be really inclusive and hold a space for difference, right? And we're not really trying to make sure that everyone is, you know, agreeing and on the same page. That's fine that we all think differently, but we really need to respect one another. Um, and I'm always happy to be that person to just shut these things down because, you know, I just sometimes wish that someone was there to shut things down when things got uncomfortable for me. So I'm just like, I will hold that space if I need to, because my God, if someone else has to go through it, I will be so sad. And for my end, uh, especially recently, I have been working at Harvard. I've been working as the accessibility coordinator for this like student organization called Women in Design. And basically my job, you know, for this specific like virtual education setting is to make sure, you know, when they have meetings, there is subtitles in the Zoom, you know, for their video recordings. And when they put poster out there on Instagram, the color combination, the color scheme need to work for people with visual impairment or color blindness. So a lot of times, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot, it's, it's a lot of like repetition of asking questions and you know, telling people to make edits, you know, when they're uncomfortable about it, because like sometimes some designer they have a very kind of you know their own strict sense of aesthetics, with like you know specific fonts and color layout they use. So at the end of the day, it's really about you know, asking questions, like you know, informing people that this is important because inclusivity does not equal equity, and you know there is another extra step that you know, requires a lot of compromises in order to achieve equity. So yes, that is my take on this. Thank you. Um, so follow up to this one. This is a, a question that was actually based on a sharp question from our opening plenary by one of the panelists, Jingyi Li. Um, both of you tackle subject matters that are quite heavy, like, and that might be very personal or might have like, that could be very like <laughs> overwhelming at times, right? Um, how do you balance producing this kind of critical work and creating these spaces while maintaining your own mental health? Sometimes I wonder if I'm actually even remotely sane. So like, I'm kind of like, my first answer is like, I don't actually even know. Like, like someone help me, tell me. Um, <laughs> but. Honestly, you know, it's it's the things that you do outside the job that, you know, kind of keep me sane, right? Like I, I do, I, I even though I make a lot of serious games and I play a lot of serious games, I play a lot of just like entertainment games where I can just like shut my brain off and be like, all right, here I am, just gonna throw this grenade, I guess, because why not? Hey, Call of Duty, whatever, right? Um, or I also cook a lot or like, you know, I just got a new puppy. And so now, you know, we go take walks and actually he's helping me walk more and enjoy uh, how beautiful my neighborhood actually is and all the different color trees that are around. And so it, it's really like sometimes taking a step back, especially when, you know, you're, you're feeling like you're definitely making change in the world. And then sometimes like, you know, like Twitter is on fire and then you're reminded, oh, wow, actually the world is still kind of bad, but you kind of, you know, hold the space of the things that you did really well and you fill up your own kind of personal bucket with all the other good in the world. And I kind of like reach out to my friends, you know, to also create that support barrier. So that's how I think I stay sane. But again, I, just, I, don't, I don't know. I agree. Like, I don't know if I'm actually, you know, same either. And I think the reason that I'm, why I'm so interested in, you know, integrating therapeutic experiences into my work is like, I need that. A lot of times I'm just so stressed. Like I was, so then I feel like, you know, creating something that is therapeutic and pacifying is, you know, kind of like relaxes me a little bit, at least when I'm working on it. When I was working on the, uh, the, the neck project, I like wear the thing so it massages while I like I'm like fixing its coding on the computer and it would just like continue for like an hour 
Um, and also kind of, you know, beyond that, I agree with Ash, you know, definitely, definitely have, you know, have life, cultivate a life, please, you know, outside of your work, uh, you know, rent your friends if necessary and develop other hobbies. And I think it's also very important to realize, you know, which took me a lot of time to realize that at the end of your day, you know, your, your work is not everything. And, you know, there are other stuff that are more important beyond that. And, you know, one day if I can't make, you know, if I can't make art, like, I think I will be fine because there are still other attributes of me that are important to me as a, per as a person. Um, Marie-Claire, do you have a question by any chance? Should I meet you? No? Okay. But hi to your cat. <laughs> oh, <it's> so cute. <laughs> um, Whoops, I muted myself instead by accident. Um, one of my follow-up questions is, I think it got touched a couple times before um, by Snow and Ash, is this idea of the concept of seriousness in games and artwork. Um, and this has been around for a long time, so I know that Ash is probably like, oh God, not this again. So I guess, what are your thoughts, both of you, on the idea of institutional legitimacy in the world word serious why do works have to be serious? And what's the role of like whimsical or comedic things um, in games, media art, your own projects? I don't know, like, ser like, like everything in the world is just serious, right? Like everything is just, sometimes I feel like it's just too serious. Um, and then there, there's this weird thing about games where sometimes people think that games are so frivolous and that you can't take them seriously but then i'm like but if people can play football and soccer seriously then why can't you play another game seriously and then it just gets into this weird like logical loop and i'm just like over it really quickly um but i feel like again because there's so much like seriousness and like like hardship in the world like how might we actually bring like brevity and light to the things that we experience. And I think that's where the whimsy and the fun and the, and the humor and the comedy really helps us to kind of like, you know, even understand some of the, the systems that we're currently in. Um, and also I, there's a, just a way to also make things more hopeful, right? When you take a kind of humorous, whimsical approach. It's the reason why like, I love a good cyberpunk narrative, but I'm kind of also over all the dark dinginess of everything, like I'm dealing with, late stage capitalism, like right now, like I'm over that. So like, like how might we think about a solar punk future? Like what would it look like for us to actually live in harmony with the environment that we're, we live in? And what does, what, what does that afford us in terms of conflict that might be a little bit more hopeful, right? I just, I, I, I'm, I'm totally over seriousness right now because everything is just way too serious. And it's just, it's 2020, it's hard, right? Like how can we just bring joy and happiness to people? And in terms of seriousness, seriousness, so like when you mentioned the word serious, like in terms of like the context of art, like I first picture it as something that's talking about very like critical social issues, but like in the pedestal of a gallery. So it, in a way it's like, you know, in this very elite intellectual environment that is not necessarily you know, accessible to, you know, the general public, like the lay person. And I think, you know, kind of echo what, uh, what As was saying, like it's 2020, like I think that's a obs obsolete way of, you know, trying to communicate inf information. And ultimately I think, you know, even if we're talking about like very heavy social subjects, there's like a gazillion way you can communicate it. And there's a handful way that you can make it playful, fun, you know, uh, in ways that are more accessible and humorous or even entertaining to people. But, you know, still get that message across. So I think, you know, seriousness is just really something that is uh, an old kind of uh, remain of this elite image of the intellectuals, you know, from a long time ago. And with, you know, everything like happening on the web right now, I think that is not applicable for, you know, the future of the creative industry. Great. And just for everyone, for like a fun random fact, 
Um, apparently, ironically, in design, the year 2020 was labeled as the perfect vision year for a long time. So yeah, I'm with Ash on that one. And so now, like, wow, Ooh. what a time. <laughs> Welcome cool. to 2020. Oh my god. I was like going through some videos and I saw that as like a quote. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> but anyways, we're getting to the end of the panel. And I know that I'm really thankful for everyone that's been sticking up, sticking around this long. Um, one of the questions that we wanted to make sure we asked our panelists was what advice that they had for people entering their field. But I'm going to try and flip this around and ask them, if you met yourself five to 10 years ago before you like had that critical moment that got you, got you into the field, what advice would you have given yourself at the time? Clarifying question. And we are ignoring the fact that 2020 is a dumpster fire. And I'm not talking to them about that, right? I'm not talking to past Ashlyn about 2020. We, we can make that two questions. We'll, okay. we'll first make the without 2020 existing question. Okay, very and good. And then the version that's like, you get there and you're like, 2020 is going to be horrible. Girl, girl, <laughs> fling yourself into space, right? Like, okay, okay, very good. Um, <laughs> I think... Um, that I would actually have the conversation that, you know, educational games are like, because this is the, this is the kind of like encouragement that I needed to stay in educational games as long as I have, is that there is a space and a need and a want for that. Um, and that even though there are many folks who understand that space and are kind of like hardcore gamers like you, like keep playing games, keep going into spaces where you actually don't know what people are talking about because that will be so helpful to design better educational games. You can then ask the questions that experts no longer ask, which is why do you all do it this way? And why do you still do it this way? Or what is this baseline definition? And they're like, oh, I guess I didn't know that. Like a couple of days ago, you know, I'm, I'm working with a, a couple of doctors to try and figure out how we can create a social justice uh, curriculum for medical students to understand health disparities um, at, at a racial and, racial and gender level. And so they're, they're really focused on gun violence. And they, and, you know, they said that, oh, you know, we're trying to you know, talk to patients about the trauma doctors they interacted with. And I was just like, are trauma doctors the same as ER doctors? And they looked at me and they're like, no, they're two different things. And I was like, oh, really? Okay. Uh, do your patients know that trauma doctors and ER doctors are two different things? And they're like, we have no idea. And I'm like, cool. So maybe in the in the curriculum, like probably in your survey, you're probably actually going to have to differentiate that for them as well. Um, and it's moments like that. In, in like now it's amazing, but five years ago, I just felt kind of drained. Um, something that I would say advice for my past self is first one is like, you know, don't be afraid about talking to people and asking questions, even dumb questions. And also just like, you know, generally, you know, consume content, you know, all different kinds of content, you know, books, and uh, media, you know, even something that might not be considering, you know, uh, like a valuable source of information in the mainstream perspective, just like, you know, try to absorb, you know, all different, as diverse of a, a di diverse of a type of information as possible. Yes, because uh, back then, you know, I, I, I grew up in the Chinese education system. So that, that involved a lot of like laborious, like study for the, you know, doing your homework, study for the exam and get a good score. And I totally hated that. And, you know, also that's just useless when you have to get a job or like, you know, do research in the future. And so last thing I would advise for my past up is um, don't try so hard to please your Chinese parents because at the end of the day, they're never that pleased and um, they just have to deal with it. And yeah. Love it, thank you. So we're hitting the one hour and 25 minute mark. Um, for all of our viewers right now, thank you very much for, for like joining in, being here with us. Um, I'm gonna quickly share my screen. Let's put that, make that happen. Yes, I'm doing it. Um, so that was Ashlyn Sparrow and Snowshoe. Thank you very much both for being panelists today. 
Uh, and whoops, don't know where I'm clicking. The Ada Lovelace week is not over yet. There is one more day with an academia panel tomorrow um, that I talked about before. So please don't forget to tune in to that time. And for those who asked if this is recorded, yes, YouTube is horrifying and it will post a video of this immediately afterwards that I do not want to watch because I hate seeing myself. But thanks everybody for joining in. Um, this was a very insightful conversation. So yeah. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I'll end the stream. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs>